Hello, medicos. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. B K for you, and today I am going to discuss about the dural folds and the dural venous sinuses. So the learning objectives for today's class will be a general introduction about the meninges of the brain. That is the three. meningeal layers of the brain followed by that we will try to actually discuss certain aspects of the general uh, characters of the dura mater so here we are mainly going to discuss about the cranial dura mater not about the spinal dura mater then followed by that about the dural folds so their attachments and how they are formed formation and their contents then we are going to classify and uh, understand the various dural venous sinuses okay so the classification of the dural venous sinuses and uh, the tributaries and communications of the dural venous sinuses <coughs> which we are actually going to discuss today now first let us try to understand about the meninges now if you look at the layers starting from the scalp so we all have discussed about the scalp consisting of the five layers and the deepest layer of the scalp is the periosteum which is the outermost lining of the skull and then you have the skull which is a diploic bone a bone of diplo and got it has got an outer layer and then the inner layer in between you also have the uh, diploic vessels mainly the diploic veins and the arteries and then the skull bones are united together by the sutural ligaments now the innermost part of the skull is actually called as the endosteum and then you have the dura mater so the cranial dura mater mainly is in the form of two layers the outer endosteal layer and then the inner meningeal layer okay so that is the outermost covering of the dura mater then you have the arachnoid mater followed by that the pia mater now these two layers of the dura mater that is the endosteal layer and meningeal layer they are very much close to each other adhered to each other they are not uh, separable only at certain places they deviate from each other okay and then the dura has its own blood supply and the nerve supply so they are mainly called as the meningeal vessels which is present immediately deep to the dura mater so it is mainly made up of collagen fibers the dura mater is mainly made up of collagen fibers and requires less amount of nutrition so because of the presence of collagen fibers it is the toughest covering actually the name of dura or durable means tough and matter refers to mother so it is like a tough mother so deep to the dura you have the subdural space between the bone and the dura you have the extra or epidural space now again in the cranial cavity the epidural space is actually almost nil it is not present there but in the spine in the spinal cord the dura mater between that and the vertebral canal we have a epidural space so that is why we give epidural anesthesia okay the, that is more feasible here what happens is the endosteal layer it is very much adhered to the bone nearer to the bone whereas the meningeal layer is actually uh, in close contact with the the other two coverings that is the arachnoid matter and then the pia matter okay so now 
<coughs> deep to the dura as i told you you have the deep dural space and it is actually traversed by the these veins and the blood vessels arteries and the veins now if you look at the arachnoid matter deep to the arachnoid matter you see the sub arachnoid space okay it is filled with csf the cerebro spinal fluid now the space itself if you look at the arachnoid matter it is trabeculated interlaced with the fibers there are also fine collagen fibers which are actually uh, running in a cross crossed pattern so and it the arachnoid matter and the pia matter have the same source of development and uh, the cells are also mostly the same type of cells only thing is the cells of the arachnoid matter they interlock within themselves and they mainly form the tight junctions whereas in case of the pia matter they mainly form the gap junctions okay so the subarachnoid space as i told you mainly it consists of the cerebro spinal fluid so the cerebro spinal fluid enters into the csf from the ventricles so the ventricles they actually secrete the csf and then what happens is that csf enters into the subarachnoid space via the openings in the roof of the fourth ventricle so that csf completely surrounds the brain so it acts like a medium shock absorber not only that uh, it also serves to some extent the purpose of lymph because there is no lymphatics or lymph nodes inside the brain or within the cranial cavity so it is traversed again by blood vessels the subarachnoid space now the csf has again has to be drained into the veins that is mainly through this finger like projections called as the arachnoid villi so they go and actually project into the dura mater meningeal layer and thereby they drain into the dural venous sinuses okay so as i told you you are able to see this subarachnoid space is somewhat trabeculated and you have been see that space is actually traversed by the blood vessels and this are the finger like projections called as arachnoid villi which go and drain into the dural venous sinuses so thereby the csf is drained into the venous system next you are able to see is the <coughs> the subarachnoid space is enlarged at certain places and they are called as the cisterns so you are able to see between the pia and arachnoid so deep to the arachnoid at certain places you see a large collections of csf in this subarachnoid space you have large collections of the csf at certain areas and they are called as cisterns so you can tell mainly the large ponto medullary system or cisterna magna you have cisterna pontis then you have the interpeduncular cistern cisterna ambiens okay these are some of the subarachnoid cisterns next coming to the pia mater if you look at the pia mater it mainly consists again of two layers one is the epipia and then the outer surface of the brain the neural tissue is again covered by a layer of glia and that is why it is called as glia limitans on the surface of the brain now i told you the pia mater mainly is mainly made up of gap junctions and when they reflect over the surface of the brain you can see the blood vessels also traveling with them so tiny blood vessels which are present so when you remove the pia mater the pia mater along with these tiny blood vessels and the outer glial limiting membrane comes as one single layer and that is why the pia mater is also called as the uh, 
vascular membrane. The pia mater is also called as the vascular membrane and it is also responsible for the blood brain barrier. Usually the blood brain barrier is mainly formed by the endothelium of these blood vessels. Then you have a perivascular feet of the astrocytes, these two, and external to the astrocyte you also have a pia layer. Now, there is always again a contradictory opinion whether there is a sub pial space. So, deep to the pia matter, what happens is, is there a space or no? Some authors, they actually, uh, of the view, they are of the view that there is sub pial space is there. Other people, they tell that pia matter is actually intimately attached to the nervous tissue or the neural tissue. So, there is no sub pial space. This pia matter mainly what happens is it can also perform the function of pinocytosis. So engulfing some substances. It also neutralizes the neurotransmitters, takes up the neurotransmitter. So thereby it does not allow the neurotransmitter uh, to spread to the unwanted neurons. But again you can see the same function we see in the glial cells also. So, with the short introduction on the meninges of the brain, today we are going to concentrate mainly on the dura matter, that is, I told you the cranial dura matter. Now, the vault or the calvaria of the skull, one half has been removed. And now, what you are able to see here is the dura matter and all the blood vessels ramifying on the dura matter. So, the meningeal vessels, mainly meningeal vessels, we come across as the middle meningeal vessels. Other meningeal vessels are from the occipital artery. Then you have the pharyngeal artery. Ascending pharyngeal artery also gives some meningeal vessels. So I told you that the dura matter mainly is made up of two layers. One is the endosteal layer and other one is the inner meningeal layer. But both cannot be recognized at all the places. They appear as only one single layer. Now, the endosteal layer is adherent to the inner surface of the skull. Okay? And attached to the inner surface of the vault and also to the base of the skull. And finally, what happens is they are attached to the margins of the foramen magnum. Beyond that, what happens when the medulla continues as the spinal cord, it is the meningeal layer which passes through the foramen magnum. So, between the bone and the dura matter, actually there is no or nil, very scanty or no extra dural space. So, now you are able to see the dura matter has been removed what you are able to see is the cerebral hemisphere with all the blood vessels ramifying on it. The arachnoid and the pia matter, mainly the pia matter and the vessels you are able to see. Here you are able to make out the two layers, that is the endosteal layer and the uh, meningeal layer. The meningeal layer, since it is adhered to the the deeper meninges, that is the arachnoid uh, and the pia matter, which is actually called as the lepto meninges, whereas the dura matter is actually called as the pachy meninges. Okay. So, at certain areas, what happens is the endosteal layer, the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer, mainly the meningeal layer deviates or separates from the external layer to form folds. So, they invaginate into certain fissures of the brain to form a bilayered folds and they are called as the dural folds. So, now you are able to see the deeper layer as actually folded onto itself. One fold you are able to see between the two cerebral hemispheres in the sagittal sulcus. And other fold you are able to see between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So, two major folds we are able to see here. This is again a double layered fold of meningeal layer. Okay, which is vertically, it is projecting downwards. The other one is actually projecting 
uh, horizontally anteriorly it is going from posterior to anteriorly it is going that is one more dural fold okay this is a double layered fold of meningeal dura this is again a double layered fold of the meningeal dura now what is the main function is so because of these folds it actually prevents any mechanical injury of the brain during various postural movements when we move our head from side to side we bend or extend our head natural what happens is the the brain tissue okay should not go and have any impact over the skull so that is why what happens is these provide support and avoids displacement so they don't vibrate or shake inside that is one reason the second reason is between these double layered folds you are able to see it contains the dural venous sinuses okay so these folds mainly contains the dural venous sinuses most of the folds except one fold that is the cavum trigeminal which consists of the trigeminal ganglion so we will come to the <coughs> dural folds now then we will discuss about the dural venous sinuses in the second part of our class so first let us try to understand the origin insertion of these dural folds so here you are able to see one dural fold then this is the other dural fold they have removed the remaining part of the dura the place where it actually dips downwards or it actually projects anteriorly to form a double layered fold only that part has been shown in this picture so as i told you these dural folds are mainly formed by the double layered fold of the meningeal dura mater there are four folds fox cerebri okay a sickle shaped fold you are able to see that is called as the fox cerebri then you are able to see another large fold which is called as the tentorium cerebelli tentorium cerebelli it is tent shaped so that is why it is called as tentorium cerebelli like a roof of the tent it appears below the tentorium cerebelli one more fold you have the fox cerebelli and then one more two more folds are there one is diaphragma cellae and the cavum trigeminal okay so mainly the fox cerebri fox cerebelli tentorium cerebelli diaphragma cellae and then the <coughs> cavum trigeminal which has again a dural fold now first try to let us try to understand the fox cerebri i told you it is a sickle shaped fold of dura mater the antero inferiorly it is narrow and it is attached to the crista galli and the internal frontal crest then it runs above and here it is situated in the sulcus in the sagittal sulcus on the roof of the skull and as it appears as it approaches the posterior part internal occipital protuberance it is broad okay so it broad and this fold dips into the median longitudinal fissure the fissure which separates the two cerebral hemispheres okay so it dips into the median longitudinal fissure so thereby what happens is it actually prevents the displacement of the two cerebral hemispheres okay so you can see that the same pattern you can observe even in a walnut like the brain the walnut seed is present inside and uh, you can see that same type of dural folds also in the wall that you can examine so anterior end i told you it is attached to the crista galli and the frontal crest posteriorly it is attached to the upper surface of tentorium cerebelli so this fold you are seeing is the tentorium cerebelli it is cut so that uh, you see what is present beneath or uh 
on the under surface of the tentorium cerebelli. Okay, so it is attached to the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli. Now, within this double layered fold of dura mater, mainly you come across the two sinuses. One is the superior sagittal sinus and other one is the inferior sagittal sinus. The superior sagittal sinus is actually along the upper border or upper attached border whereas the inferior sagittal sinus is along the lower free border. Okay. It is actually present along the lower free border. Now remember this upper attached border is the place of junction of this meningeal layer and the endosteal layer. Same way here also a meningeal layer and endosteal layer. But here it is only a free meningeal layer alone. It is a free edge of the lower border of the Fox cerebri which contains the inferior sagittal sinus. Then one more sinus, straight sinus is seen at the junction of Fox cerebri with the tentorium cerebelli. Okay. It is seen at the junction of the Fox cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli. So three sinuses you can appreciate. Superior sagittal, inferior sagittal and then the tentorium cerebelli. The next fold you are able to see that is the tentorium cerebelli. It is somewhat tent shaped. So sloping downwards and laterally. If you come medially, it actually it is at a higher plane. So above the tentorium cerebelli, you call it a supratentorial compartment. And below the tentorium cerebelli, it is the infratentorial compartment. So the tentorium cerebelli mainly divides the posterior cranial fossa into the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment. So this fold projects into the transverse fissure, separating your cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellar hemispheres, especially the occipital lobes are present in the supratentorial compartment, whereas the cerebellum is present uh, below the, the uh, tentorium cerebelli that is in the infratentorial compartment. The tentorium cerebelli has got an attached border. You are able to see it is attached to the bone. And at the same time, it has also got a free border. Attached border and a free border. So this is your occipital bone. And as you come, you laterally, that will be your temporal bone. Mastoid part of your temporal bone. Squamous part of your temporal bone. This is your endosteal layer of dura mater and the meningeal layer. Now the meningeal layer is actually entering into the transverse fissure and then it folds onto itself. Double layered fold it forms. And that fold is actually attached here to the internal occipital protuberance okay, and then the occipital sulcus. It is attached to the internal occipital protuberance, occipital sulcus and then the upper surface of the petrous part of temporal bone or superior margin of the petrous part of temporal bone. So this is the upper margin of the petrous part of temporal bone. Then we have seen in the occipital, along the occipital sulcus it is attached. And finally, it extends to attach to the posterior clinoid process, which you see on the dorsum cellae. Okay. The attached border contains, you are able to see that is the transverse sinus on both the sides, the right transverse sinus and the left transverse sinus. Then along the petrous temporal upper margin that is the superior petrosal sinus. You come across the superior petrosal sinus. The free border is U-shaped and it is actually called as the tentorial notch. The free border tentorial notch. 
this notch is for the transmission of the midbrain. So the midbrain passes to the tentorial notch and continues downwards. Brain stem, pons, and medulla oblongata. The free border actually crosses the attached border at the apex of the petrous temporal bone and it is attached to the anterior clinoid process. It is attached to the anterior clinoid process. So here it is related to the roof of the cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus is on either side of the sphenoid bone. We will be discussing in detail about the cavernous sinus in the next class. So the anterior clinoid process receives the attachment of the free border. So here at this place, at the apex part of Peter's temporal, the attached border and the free border, they cross. And at that part, the oculomotor nerve pierces. Okay? The oculomotor nerve pierces. So that is about the tentorium cerebelli, which has got an attached and a free border. Attached border mainly has the superior petrosal sinus and the transverse sinus. Your right and left transverse sinus. This is the straight sinus which is seen at the junction of the tentorium. And what was here above is the posterior end of the fox cerebri. The next dural fold is the fox cerebelli. So a small shikle shaped fold you are able to see here that is actually the fox cerebelli. The fox cerebelli again it has got a attached border to the internal occipital crest. Okay. Internal occipital crest and uh, above the broad end attaches to the under surface of the tentorium cerebelli. And the under surface it attaches to the tentorium cerebelli and the small pointed tip it actually bifurcates or deviates to get attached to the margins of foramen magnum. Foramen magnum. So the anterior border is free. The posterior border is attached to the occipital crest. Superiorly it is attached to the under surface of the tentorium cerebelli. And the apex actually deviates to get attached around the margins of the foramen magnum. The fox cerebelli contains the occipital sinus. So this free border extends into the cerebellar notch, posterior cerebellar notch, a notch you can see between the two cerebellar hemispheres. Two cerebellar hemispheres. Same way there is also an anterior notch. So posteriorly you can see a, a faint longitudinal fissure called as the posterior cerebellar notch which incomplete separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. Next, coming to the, the diaphragma cilli. So the diaphragma cilli is actually a dura mater which lodges the pituitary gland. So that is the pituitary gland. A double layered fold of dura mater which stretches across the cella tarsica. Which stretches across the cella tarsica. Okay. So here you will be able to see the diaphragma cilli. So which stretches across the roof of the cella tarsica. So now you are able to see this is actually the dural fold. The diaphragma cilli. Okay, so that is the anterior clinoid process and that should be your posterior clinoid process. Transversely stretching across the cella tarsica and in the midline it has an opening for the pituitary stalk. It has the opening for the pituitary stalk. Now because this is a meningeal layer and uh, this pituitary gland is resting on the upper surface of the sphenoid bone which is again lined by the endosteal layer. Which is again lined by the endosteal layer. Okay. So this is actually the opening in the diaphragma cilia which is pierced by the pituitary stalk. 
between the two layers you have the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus okay so anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus you will see in the diaphragma cellae which contains a dural venous sinus which connects the cavernous sinus of either side which connects the cavernous sinus of the either side okay the next fold as i told you is the cavum trigeminal so here on the anterior sloping surface of petrous temporal you see a small depression fossa for the trigeminal ganglion so the trigeminal ganglion here you are able to see when the dura is stripped off before that you can see it has a dural covering so the endosteal layer will be present adherent to the bone and above that what happens is the meningeal layer so between the endosteal layer below and the meningeal layer above you can see the trigeminal ganglion now the trigeminal ganglion you are able to see it arises from the pons a sensory root this is the sensory root which forms a bulging or ganglion here now as it comes from the pons it brings along with it a meningeal layer of dura mater so which means the ganglion itself has its own covering of meningeal diverticulum so first it is covered by meningeal layer above and below then again it is covered by the two layers of the dura mater so that means above the trigeminal ganglion you have two meningeal layers of dura mater okay one is the meningeal layer of the skull itself the other one which is brought about by the trigeminal ganglion below the trigeminal ganglion you have one layer of the endosteal dura mater and one layer of meningeal so two meningeal layers above one meningeal layer and one meningeal endosteal layer below the trigeminal ganglion so that is about the cavum trigeminal <coughs> so next <coughs> we will pass on to the nerve supply anterior cranial fossa dura of the anterior cranial fossa is mainly supplied by the anterior ethmoidal nerve which is from the <coughs> ophthalmic division okay so the trigeminal nerve gives ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular and again ophthalmic gives rise to lacrimal frontal and nasociliary so this nasociliary nerve gives to anterior ethmoidal posterior ethmoidal nerves the anterior ethmoidal nerve supplies the dura of the anterior cranial fossa middle cranial fossa is mainly supplied by the nervous spinosum mandibular nerve from the trunk gives the nervous spinosum which enters to the foramen ovale to supply the dura of the middle cranial fossa then also by the recurrent branch from the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve okay for the tentorium cerebelli posterior cranial fossa from the cranial nerve 9th 10th and 12th and also by upper three cervical nerves upper three cervical nerves so clinical aspects mainly stretching of the dura mater stretching of dura mater produces frontal or parietal headache so in inflammation or when the dura mater is stretched stretched there may be so many reasons it might also takes place in case of meningioma or any hematoma might be formed any space occupying lesion might also stretch the dura mater in such case what happens is you get frontal or parietal headache if the dura mater of the supratentorial compartment because it is mainly supplied by the branches of trigeminal nerve so pain as frontal and parietal headache so if the infratentorial compartment the dura of the infratentorial compartment is inflamed meningitis mainly inflammation due to meningitis or any infections extra cranially might uh, transmit then to intracranial 
then it is manifested pain is manifested over the occipital at the behind the head and posterior neck pain and rigidity this is mainly because it is supplied by the upper three cervical nerves okay that is the main reason so fracture of the skull mainly leads to tearing of the dura so if the dura is torn then subdural hematoma occurs if the veins are actually torn and epidural hematoma occurs collection of blood if the arteries are torn okay so tearing of the dura mainly occurs in the fractures of the skull so that is about the dural folds now coming to the dural venous sinuses now what are actually dural venous sinuses they are more like the veins but how do they differ from the veins they lack a muscular coat okay so tunica adventitia is there so instead of tunica adventitia you have this meningeal layer of dura mater which uh, serves the function of the tunica adventitia second thing is the interior of this is lined by the endothelium so there is no tunica media or tunica adventitia is mainly formed by this meningeal layer of dura so all the dural venous sinuses are mainly present between the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer this is endosteal layer meningeal layer is actually forming a fold there you have a dural venous sinus okay so most of the dural venous sinuses are present between the endosteal and the infolding of the meningeal layer except the inferior sagittal which is seen within the meningeal layer itself and other one is the straight sinus again that is also seen within the meningeal layer so except these two all the other sinuses are present between the junction of the endosteal and the meningeal layer so they drain the blood mainly from the brain diplo of the skull diploic veins from the orbit from the internal ear and also from the nasal cavity sometimes it also uh, occasionally a vein might connect through the nasal cavity then they actually communicate with the extracranial veins through the emissary veins so because of these communications what happens is they are able to maintain the intracranial pressure so that the intracranial pressure does not rise if the dural venous sinuses are actually obstructed blocked mainly due to a septic thrombosis then naturally what happens is the intracranial pressure increases so here you are able to see the representation of the dural venous sinuses okay they are all just lined by endothelium and outer to endothelium you have the dura mater so apart from draining the veins venous drainage of the brain diplo of skull and from the orbit and from the internal ear they also are responsible for the csf drainage this i have spoken the initial slide itself the arachnoid villi they go and project over the superior sagittal sinus forming arachnoid granulations through which the csf is drained into the venous blood now we have two types of dural venous sinuses one is the paired sinus and other one is the unpaired sinus so unpaired sinus there are almost uh, seven sinuses superior inferior straight occipital anterior posterior intercavernous and basilar venous plexus okay paired sinuses you have cavernous sinus superior petrosal sinus inferior petrosal sinus then the transverse sinus sigmoid sinus and spino parietal sinus okay then one more you have the petrosquamous okay so there are actually 23 sinuses 
So now coming to the each and every sinus, we will try to understand. First is the, we will finish off with this unpaired sinuses. Superior sagittal sinus. The first one is the superior sagittal sinus. So present along the attached border of the fox cerebri. Then present along the attached border of the fox cerebri. Now this sinus here where the fox cerebri actually is attached to the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli, it continues as the right transverse sinus. Usually it continues as the right transverse sinus. But sometimes it might also continue as left transverse sinus and very rarely it might also bifurcate into right and left transverse sinus. But most commonly it continues as the right transverse sinus. Now what are the tributaries? Mainly you can see the superior cerebral veins. So the superior cerebral veins you are able to see here. They drain into the superior sagittal sinus. Then also they receive the arachnoid granulations. And at certain places you can see three venous lacunae. So they are all some enlarged spaces which are actually called as the venous lacunae. The venous lacunae, they drain the diploic veins and the meningeal veins. Okay, They mainly drain the diploic and meningeal veins but they don't drain the superior cerebral veins, the venous lacunae. And they are present at the frontal, parietal and at the occipital in position. So the tributaries of the superior sagittal sinus are mainly superior cerebral veins. Then you have the diploic veins, mainly as I told you, the diploic veins from the venous lacunae, they are present at the frontal parietal and they are occipital in positions. Diploic veins, they drain and emissary veins. Parietal emissary veins to so the parietal foramina, what happens? comes and actually communicates. Then it also communications to the nasal cavity through a patent foramen cecum. This is not always present but sometimes a vein from the nasal cavity to the superior sagittal sinus through the patent foramen cecum. This is possible. So naturally infections to the superior sagittal sinus can also reach via the nasal cavity. So parietal emissary veins to the scalp. It communicates the scalp extracranial and intracranial veins. And it also communicates with the cavernous sinus through the superior anastomotic vein. Okay. With cavernous sinus through the superior anastomotic vein of the trolad. It is actually called as the superior anastomotic vein of the trolad. So thrombosis of superior sagittal sinus may take place infections from the nose as I told you. Scalp. Infections of the scalp extracranially and also from the diploic tissue. Diplo of the skull. So mainly it increases the intravenous pressure, increased intracranial pressure because the CSF is not getting absorbed. Mainly the CSF is absorbed in the superior sagittal sinus. The next sinus is the inferior sagittal sinus. With respect to the inferior sagittal sinus, it occupies the lower free margin of the fox cerebri. And mainly collects blood from the fox cerebri itself and also from the veins on the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. Okay. Medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere and it terminates into the straight sinus. The, you are able to see here that is the inferior sagittal sinus. They drain into the straight sinus. So that is the straight sinus which is present at the attached border of the posterior attached the fox cerebri and the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli. So next coming to the straight sinus at the junction of fox cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli.
it is mainly formed by the union of the inferior sagittal sinus okay mainly formed by the union of inferior sagittal sinus continuation of inferior sagittal sinus and also receives the great cerebral vein of galen okay it mainly receives the great cerebral vein of galen the yeah. the great cerebral vein of galen is again formed by the union of two internal cerebral veins internal cerebral veins the straight sinus usually continues as the left transverse sinus okay so its tributaries are inferior sagittal sinus great cerebral vein of galen and few superior cerebellar veins few superior cerebellar veins so that is about the straight sinus great cerebral vein of the galen formed by the two internal cerebral veins occipital sinus which is seen within the fox cerebelli present along the attached border of the fox cerebelli terminates at the confluence of the sinus the occipital sinus mainly is formed by few venous radicals along the margins of the foramen magnum okay mainly formed by few radicals of the foramen magnum and they form the occipital sinus which actually through a connecting vein to the confluence of the sinus confluence of sinus next is the anterior intracavernous and posterior intracavernous sinus they connect the two cavernous sinus of both the sides the anterior and posterior intracavernous sinus are present within the diaphragma cell so these two cavernous sinus and the anterior and posterior cavernous sinus also forms the circular sinus is thus formed around the cella tarsica circular sinus is formed around the cella tarsica then on the clivus bone you see the basilar plexus of veins they mainly connect the inferior petrosal sinus inferior petrosal sinus of both the sides and below they pass through the foramen magnum to communicate with the internal vertebral venous plexus so internal vertebral venous plexus is present within the vertebral canal okay so that is the main function of the basilar plexus of veins and finally what is the confluence of sinus so superior sagittal sinus posterior end it gets bulged and from there it continues as right transverse sinus continues as right transverse sinus so the confluence of sinus is the meeting point of superior sagittal sinus right transverse sinus occipital sinus drains into the confluence and yeah anastomotic vein between the right and left transverse sinus so that is called as the confluence of sinus or it is also named as the tors erophilius okay so that is about the confluence of sinus now coming to the paired sinuses so far we have seen unpaired sinuses superior sagittal inferior sagittal then we have seen the straight sinus occipital sinus anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus and then the basilar plexus of veins coming to the paired sinus the first one we will discuss about the transverse you have the right and the left transverse right transverse is a continuation of the superior sagittal and left is actually continuation of the straight sinus okay so they are seen along the posterior attached margin of the tentorium cerebelli along the occipital sulcus now the transverse sinus as they pass through the mastoid angle of the parietal bone then they continue as the sigmoid sinus okay so at the mastoid angle of the parietal bone they actually continue as the sigmoid sinus so mainly it receives so that is the transverse sinus you are able to see here continuing as the sigmoid sinus at the mastoid angle of the parietal bone superior petrosal sinus so it is the communication between the transverse and the 
cavernous sinus. The superior petrosal sinus ends at the junction where the transverse sinus continues as the sigmoid sinus. Okay, transverse sinus continues as the sigmoid sinus. Then it receives some few inferior cerebral veins, then some cerebellar veins, inferior cerebellar veins, then temporal diploic veins and inferior anastomotic vein. These are the tributaries, mainly inferior cerebral, cerebellar, superior petrosal sinus, temporal diploic veins and anastomotic vein between the transverse and the superficial middle cerebral vein. So these are the tributaries of the transverse sinus, both the right transverse sinus and the left transverse sinus which continues as the sigmoid sinus. Now coming to the sigmoid sinus, so that is the sigmoid sinus, it is a continuation of the transverse sinus. It leaves the tentorium cerebelli. So attached border from that, it leaves the tentorium cerebelli at the mastoid angle of the parietal bone. Okay, and lodges in a S-shaped groove on the mastoid part of temporal bone, situated in the groove on the S-shaped groove at the mastoid part of temporal and jugular process of the occipital bone. It enters the jugular foramen and continues as superior bulb of internal jugular vein. So, sigmoid sinus continues as the internal jugular vein which is represented as a dilatation at its commencement called as the superior bulb of internal jugular vein. So, tributaries mainly mastoid emissary veins. Okay. So, mastoid emissary veins connecting this with the posterior auricular vein. And then you also have condylar emissary veins connecting into the suboccipital venous plexus and a few cerebellar and labyrinthine veins from the internal ear. Mastoid emissary, posterior auricular vein. Then condylar emissary vein, you have the suboccipital venous plexus, labyrinthine veins from the internal ear. So because of this thrombosis of sigmoid sinus may take place from infections of the middle ear or mastoid antrum because the sinus is actually separated from the mastoid antrum by a very thin plate of bone and mastoid air cells. Transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus together are also called as the lateral sinus. Okay, it is called as the lateral sinus. Next, coming to the superior and inferior petrosal sinus. Okay. Superior petrosal sinus along the upper border of the petrous temporal. The attached border of the tentorium cerebelli connects the cavernous sinus with the transverse sinus. The place where the transverse continues as the sigmoid, the superior petrosal sinus actually comes and drains into it. So, it mainly tributaries are some inferior cerebellar, cerebellar and veins from the tympanic cavity. Inferior petrosal sinus is actually situated in a groove between the petrous temporal okay, and from the actually the groove between the petrous temporal and the base occiput. It is again a communication between the cavernous sinus and internal jugular vein. It is the first tributary of the internal jugular vein because it passes through the jugular foramen and drains into the internal jugular vein separately. Inferior petrosal sinus. Again, labyrinthine veins, here you have the internal auditory matter, so naturally it receives some labyrinthine veins and veins from the medulla, pons and cerebellum, brain stem or medulla, pons and cerebellum mainly structures developed from the Hind brain. Okay, so that is about the inferior petrosal sinus. Mainly, it connects the cavernous sinus to the internal jugular vein. Okay, I told you it is the first tributary of the internal jugular vein. So, thrombosis of this uh, inferior petrosal sinus from infections of middle ear or internal ear. And it might also involve the trigeminal and abducent nerves, branches of trigeminal abducent, because from here the infection can spread to cavernous sinus. So the first two divisions of cavernous sinus and abducent nerve are all present 
very closely or intimately related to the cavernous sinus. The next uh, dural venous sinus, spinoparietal sinus, you are able to see along the lesser wing of sphenoid. On the surface of the lesser wing of sphenoid, it drains into the cavernous sinus. Sometimes it might receive the frontal trunk of the middle meningeal vein. The next is petrosquamous sinus. When present on the petrosquamous fissure, drains into the transverse sinus. Or sometimes it might also drain into the pterygoid plexus. But mostly drains into the cavernous sinus or transverse sinus. Anteriorly, it communicates with the retromandibular vein, middle meningeal vein. They are mostly called as sinuses and accompany the branches of middle meningeal artery. So, here you are able to see the branches of middle meningeal artery, frontal and the parietal trunk. Frontal trunk and the posterior trunk is actually called as the parietal trunk. So, both trunks, they communicate with the superior sagittal sinus through the venous lacunae. We saw three venous lacunae along the superior sagittal sinus. Frontal trunk mainly drains into pterygoid venous plexus or into spheroparietal sinus or cavernous sinus. Whereas, posterior trunk mainly drains into the pterygoid plexus of veins, parietal trunk. Okay. So, that is about the middle meningeal vein. So, coming to the clinical aspects. So, thrombosis, as I told you, sigmoid sinus from infections of middle ear or mastoid antrum because they are separated by a very thin plate of bone. It might also spread to the superior sagittal sinus. So, infections from here can also spread to the superior sagittal sinus. Inferior petrosal sinus, labyrinthine vein, so naturally from internal and middle ear. From here it can spread to the cavernous sinus. Then middle meningeal veins are torn in the fractures of the skull. Okay. So mainly they are responsible for producing the hematoma. So that is all about the dural folds and dural venous sinuses. And thank you very much for your patient listening.